hopefully I can give you good information. We're going to talk a little bit about pruning. I am not an expert, uh, but I'm pretty good. I mean, I'm okay. Uh, but we're going to talk about pruning today. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Tools for pruning. Here we go. This is a very small grouping of the tools you can use to hack off pieces of a plant. This is my favorite. These are bypass pruners. There's two kinds of pruner, hand pruners that you can use. One's a bypass, which means the blades pass each other. But any cheap pruners will do the job. You'll notice the difference between doing the job and not doing the job when it doesn't cut so well. But what you want is a bypass pruner where the blades pass each other. In, if you get a bypass pruner, that means that you're cutting. If you get an anvil pruner, which that in an anvil pruner, this blade comes up against a solid surface. And what it does is it crushes the plant. You don't want to crush a stem on any plant when you cut it. If you can avoid it, vegetative is not so much as important as a woody plant because if you crush a plant stem, you introduce uh, ragged edges, which is a good entry point for diseases and bugs. That's the only reason you don't want to crush a stem. The next on that, this list, would be a lopper. This again is a bypass lopper. You'll notice that that blade passes. It's not crushing, it's cutting. This particular lopper has gears in it. So you get a lot more oomph. Unfortunately, by, or loppers with gears in them also have a tendency, because you're exerting so much pressure, they have a tendency for the handles to break. This is a Fiskars. And it has a lifetime guarantee. So if you break the candles, you can call the company. <laughs> um, by just, you know, it, you just have to be careful. Yeah, little ones, you're fine. If you go out like me and you're trying to hack off a two inch branch, eventually you're going to break your, your loppers. And, and I have. Yes, I have. This. <sighs> this is a saw. It's a beautiful little saw. You can cut through six inches of booty material in five minutes with this. And you get good exercise. This is a killer saw. My husband told me I needed to take a safety course before I was allowed to operate it. <laughs> <laughs> this saw cost $85, but it is magnificent. <laughs> I love that saw. And uh, that's all I have. Now there's lots of, lots of, lots of cutting tools. You also have chainsaws. You, now you have battery operated itty bitty chainsaws with a, a, a bar like this. You have electric chainsaws. You have battery operated chainsaws with the bars anywhere from here to here. Now those charges on those batteries doesn't last very long, so don't expect to be out there for too awful long. You also have electric chainsaws. You have pole saws where you can reach up without getting on a ladder, which at my age is ridiculous. I will never get on a ladder and do any work again. Um, so there's a whole myriad of tools that you can use. I just try to use the ones that are easiest for me. You all do the same. Please, please be safe. My husband cut his leg last year, and I told him that for the first time in 20 years, 20, no, 30, 36 years, he was going to have a lost time accident. And he proved me wrong by going out the next day and doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> so j just be careful, please. So that's what we, I got for you right now as far as tools. This is not an extensive list, but it is a, a place to get started. Timing. Flowering trees and bushes. Trees and shrubs, you should follow these guidelines. If the plant blooms before May, spring flowering, prune it after it blooms. This is for woody or herbaceous plants. The reason for that is if that plant blooms later in the season, it is developing its next year's buds for blooming after it blooms later. And if you prune it, you're pruning off next year's flowers. You'll still get some flowers, but you won't get the same amount. Uh, for plants which bloom on woody material during the dormant period, winter is best. Right now, for the bulk of plants, is when you should be pruning. From now until February. You want to plant, uh, you want to, uh, now 
the absolute best way to investigate is to look up the plant online and ask when is the best time to prune this specific plant, this spe specific lilac bush, this specific uh, wajelia, to get a definitive answer. But if it blooms it later in the year, you'll want to uh, prune it during a dormant period. Right now, no leaves on the trees. This is a dormant period. Okay. Winter, while plants are dormant, remove dead. This is the first rule or the first three rules of pruning. First, you remove any dead material. If it's dead, take it out. Step back and look at your plant. Say, okay, next, I remove any diseased or dying material because that's going to be dead. Step back and look at it. Next, I remove any branches that cross over one another. You see this branch right here? It's crossing, well, pick out which one you like the best. These two branches are cutting, uh, crossing over one another. And over the course of the year, you're going to get wind and uh, rain. And it's going to cause these branches as they grow to eventually rub up against again, each other. And as they do that, they're going to damage one another. So take them out before they cause damage and become dead and dying or dead. And you'll be better off. So if it was left to me, I'd take off this one. That leaves a scaffold. You prune, well this one, this one's so uh, small it doesn't matter. Anything less than your little finger, you can take it off any time. Try to cut it off, you don't want a ragged edge when you prune. So if, you, if I rip this off, I'm going to rip down into this bark. So cut it off. Shrubs grown for foliage, barberry, burning bush, euonymus, winter pruning, bush berries, blueberry, gooseberry, currants, um, oldest stems only. You leave the new growth because that's going to get the berries. Um, early spring, when new growth starts to appear, summer flowering perennials, daisies, coneflowers, cut down last year's growth. Now there's a new tendency in the, in the gardening world to leave your dead stems. If you have a, 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 if you live in an HOA and you have this specific spot with your perennials growing, they're not going to like it that you leave your dead and dying plants sticking up through the winter. But if you can, they're finding it, it current research, current exploration indicates that in those stems is where the beneficial insects for next year, eggs are laid, bugs are growing. So if you can, if you can't, if you can set it over to one side so those bugs can continue to develop until um, next spring and then pop out, that's good too. There's no need to drag all that stuff away. I know most pe a lot of people have very meticulous yards and can't do that. I'm not one of those people. All my stuff just looks dead and stays there. <laughs> <laughs> In the early spring, you want to uh, prune your ornamental grasses, remove old dead growth. You can do that with a chainsaw or any other kind of saw that's electric. You just go into your grass and you just cut it off just like that. And then it comes back. Um, roses, remove dead, damaged, or diseased branches only. Be careful not to, again, we're, we're getting new buds. Next year's buds are on last year's growth and, and, or older growth. It can be this year's growth, but it grew a few months ago. Pruning order, dead wood, then diseased wood, then any branches that are crossed over or rubbing, then prune according to aesthetics. Where do I want this branch to develop? Where do I want this, this, this tree to grow? Because on this bush, you'll see that I have a branch going this way and a branch going this way. Well, what if I have a wall right here? I want this branch to grow, not this branch, because this branch will end up growing into that wall. I don't want to put it out of balance now, but uh, where do I want this plant to grow? Typically, see this is, an, a mis this is a misnomer, these have opposite branches. and This area up here is alternate. But try to envision where this branch will grow over time. 
Try to envision where this branch will grow over time. And wherever I want that plant to be next season, because again, you can always go back in and cut again, is where I cut. If I want this branch to develop, I cut right here. If I want this branch to develop, I cut right here. Why prune? <coughs> in agriculture endeavors, your apples, your peaches, your almonds, your whatever, you want more sunlight to get into your plant. The more sunlight that gets into your plant, the more fruit you'll get. If you have a dense, dark canopy on your tree, you're not going to get the same amount of apple development. You're not going to get the same amount of peach or nectarine development. So you want sunlight and air to get into your plant. Um, the next reason is you prune to remove diseased material from the plant. And you prune to strengthen your stems and branches. For Scythia, we're going to cover some of this, the springtime flowers, or springtime bushes. They're spring flowering. They bloom, prune after bloom time. You can, any plant that you do a radical pruning to, which sometimes they invigorate a plant by really cutting it back, but you try to never cut back more than one third of the plant. For Scythia may be the exception to this because it grows so very well. But whenever you take off more than a third of the plant, you've you put your roots and your blooming material, your, flat, your greening material, out of balance. Try to never take off more than one third unless you really want to rejuvenate that plant and only have new growth coming off of it. Um, you, this plant, the first year, you pr prune it after the bloom time and forsythia for can tolerate heavy pruning and survive nicely. Virginia Sweet Spire. Sweet Spire produces white fragrant flowers in May or June or on racemes from three to six inches long. This plant can be very invasive, uh, but it's pretty good looking and it smells good. It flowers on the previous season's wood, so you prune it right after it blooms. Fall color is superb when, uh, when the green foliage, which is oblong and slightly serrated, turns to use of orange, yellow, um, and purple and remains on the plant till December. But this plant doesn't get huge. It'll just get about this big and kind of and, and bushy. Not do extremely well. It likes a little bit colder, but this year, <laughs> with the cold we're getting, it may do great. Um, it's two to 10 feet in height, mature height and width. I've never seen one 10 foot tall. That must be for upper Michigan. Um, it's deciduous. White, sweetly fragrant, four, pet four petaled flowers in June. Cultivars with double petals have eight to 30 petals. Prune after blooming or during the winter. Again, this is when you want to do it when it's dormant. Nine bark, this is a native plant particularly of benefit to local um, bees and butterflies and moths. It's a fountain-shaped deciduous shrub with overall growth form of a large spirea. And it's, the flowers are similar to a spirea. They probably are in the same family, um, except for the, the leaves are coarser. Shear for shape in the late spring. Heavy pruning can be done in winter to control the size. for its fruit bore, but for its attractive pink blossoms and ornamental qualities. It's a very hardy tree that thrives in most soil and usually grows 16 to 26 feet. I've never seen it that big here. Prune lightly after blo blooming heavy prune in the winter months. Thin out. This one gets real dense and it's a mess in there. So you, uh, the more you prune it, the better flower you'll get. And Quince, as it is in the rosaceae family, the, the rose hips or the, the hips from the flowers should probably have a good bit of vitamin C in them. Thin out dead, dying, and congested uh, branches. Rhododendron, this is one we have here. Uh, it grows in sheltered areas, um, but it likes it mild and humid. If anybody's ever been to the uh, Huntsville Botanical Garden, they have an exquisite rhododendron azalea garden and uh, it's really a nice show in the springtime. 
Uh, site sloping to the north or, nor or northeast is usually best. Always plant azaleas and rhododendrons where they get wind protection. Filtered sunlight is ideal, but morning sunlight with shade after one is satisfactory. Prune after bloom. This is one of those where you prune right after the bloom time to preserve next year's flowers. This plant requires acidic soil, so you want to acidify your soil, probably with one of the products on the market that is, uh, that I, I'm not allowed to mention any products names, but there are products on the market that will give a gentle acidification to the soil, and most of them are organic. I don't say organic's better than not inorganic. That's not my call, that's y'all's call, it's your yard. Um, but uh, this is one of the, there's a product that really helps these plants, the azalea and the rhododendrons and the camellias and the blueberries um, and the hollies, probably three or four more than I'm not remembering. Viburnum, this plant is phenomenal. There's a whole bunch of different uh, cultivars. This one, I'm not sure, might be Davidii. Uh, the, the two of them that are particularly uh, gorgeous smelling that carry you away from the, the scent in the springtime. One of them is Davidii and the other one is something that is escaping my head brain right now. But uh, the smell is exquisite. This is the same family that produces the snowball bush. The snowball bush is not a hydrangea, it is a viburnum. They can, they, there's a whole range of sizes. You can go itty bitty to way big. and. There's some variegated ones for your leaf, and it's just a spectacular plant for this area. The blooms are showy and fragrant. It, blue, it flowers on old wood, so prune immediately after blooming in order to preserve your blooms for next year, in order that you're not cutting off your blooms for next year. Does that mean acid or alkaline? Uh, this one's just pretty much neutral. It, it'll do well in, in just neutral. It'll probably tolerate a little bit of either direction. Um, use it as a hedge and shrub borders or as a foundation plant. Very fragrant flowers. I know I mentioned that like five times, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> it's got a nice fall coloration. Hydrangea. This is the one you'll get the most uh, questions about. If it blooms before, I think it's July. If it blooms before July, um, they're flowering from blossom buds on new wood. So if it starts blooming before July, that's new wood. If it blooms after July, it's blooming on old wood. So if it's, if you, you, uh, if it's blooming on old wood after July, you cut the flowers off after that. You prune it just after it blooms. Even though, I mean, you can do it individual stalks. You don't have to do the whole plant at one time. So after July, you, whatever, whatever bloom is spent, you look at that branch and you say, okay, where, well, how do I want to prune this? And that's when you prune it. If it's blooming before July, that's blooming on new wood. And you can prune that uh, after it blooms or in the winter, okay? Because you'll get new blossoms coming up. You're going to get new growth coming up that's going to give you blossoms if it blooms before July. If it blooms after July, only prune off uh, the individual stalk or um, a, as you go. You just plume, prune off as you go. If it's blooming on new wood, you're going to get new wood coming up progressively through the season. So you'll get new, new wood blooming in the early uh, part of the, of the season, which will be uh, late, late spring, early summer. And then you'll still get new blossoms after. Okay. There'll be less, but you'll still get some blossoms after. And you prune that uh, new, on new wood. You can prune new wood. But if it's growing on last year's blossoms, or last year's growth, if it's, if it's blooming past July, that means that those branches took a while to develop. And it's blooming, and so you, you you don't want to prune those. You, you prune those as you go. So this one's, this branch is blooming, or this plant is blooming after July, and it started blooming after July. I cut this branch to accommodate next year's growth. 
next year's bloom. Um, deadheading is the removal of spent blooms on the hydrangeas and cannot be do done incorrectly. So you see where they're cutting on this one? That's just a deadhead. You can't do that wrong. You're, you're just taking out the spent bloom. If you were cutting further down on that branch, you would be pruning. But if you're just taking off the spent blossom, you're deadheading, okay? Because it's above that first leaf axle. You see that? Mm -hmm. This, oh, wait a minute, I have a pointer function. Hang on. You see that right there? Okay, that right there is where the next branch is going to come out, where the next new growth is going to come out, is right there. We're going to talk about plant hormones. Believe it or not, plants have hormones um, in, a, in a couple minutes. And, and that dictates what's going on in that. Pruning to a central leader. Okay, this is what your trees typically look like when you put them in the ground. Uh, apples, pears, um, I don't know if persimmons go to a central leader or not, probably not, wait a minute. Apples, pears, apples and pears, you prune to a central leader. The second year, you prune it like this. You're planning for next year's growth, but you have a, an old tree, so we're, we, we, I don't have it, I don't know if I have any slides in here for old trees. But the second year, you see these little red marks? See that? You want this low stuff off. You want to cut there, cut there, cut there, cut there. But you still have a central leader right here. That's one big branch that's going up. When I mean big, I, when I say big, I mean relative to the, to the size of the other branches. Um, then the third year, you still have your central leader, and, but you're pruning these, because everywhere you prune, you're gonna get extra branching. The reason for that is hormones. In the tip of every branch of every woody material you have, there's something called indoleacetic acid. It's a uh, development hormone. It directs the nutrition in the plant to go to that, that, that tip that, that's going to grow more. That's why when you look at your plant, you see that that, that end tip's got six inches of growth, but these, and these side ones have done nothing or next to nothing. That's because that hormone's directing all your nutrients up there. And then as it filters down through the plant, you'll see that you're getting more growth down here because that hormone is filtered out and the, the nutrients in that plant coming up from the roots are now going over to the sides. Every time you cut that off, that hormone's gonna end up over here, so you're gonna stimulate growth over here. Every time you prune your material, you're stimulating growth to the other parts of that plant. Okay, so it can, it can get pretty confusing. Okay, fruit trees such as peaches. Peaches are gonna be your plums, your persimmons, anything that's got a stone fruit in the center. Your plums, your persimmons, your nectarines. Um, 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 palms. Like that. Anything with a stone in the middle. Uh, you want an open leader. That means you're not going to encourage a central leader in the middle of that plant. Your branches, you're going to want like a basket so that the sunlight can get into the center of that plant. Because if it doesn't, you won't get the same amount of ripening of those peaches and apricots and plums. You, you, you want, again, the rules of pruning. You don't prune to a central leader or an open leader in the beginning. Dead, and, dead material, dying material, diseased material, and then, then you prune. Uh, any, any branches that are going to be crossing over. Then you're looking at uh, an open center or a, 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 a central leader. Do you see what I mean? First is always dead and dying material. That's imperative. The open leader allows additional light to reach the center of the tree, and it allows the branches to hold the load of ripening fruit. The angle of the branch will determine how much weight it can hold. Uh, anything greater than 60 degrees is very weak. Anything less than 45 degrees is very weak. And as you'll notice with your Bradford pears, I'm not saying that this is a fruit, bear, fruit 
yielding tree, at least not for us, but anything, but as that branch, if anywhere outside of that, they're weaker. And a big windstorm comes up and it'll rip the branch right off, which is a lot of times what happens with your Bradford pears. There's a lot of backlash against Bradford pears right now. That's, that's up to y'all. Um, it's your yard, it's your, your house, if you want Bradford pears. But keep in mind, they, they very rarely last more than 20 years uh, because their branches are weak. Big windstorm, <laughs> death, death to Bradford pears. No, actually, I, I, can't, I, I know a lot of people hate them, but I'm, I'm okay with them. Small fruits such as grapes. Okay, these are your vines. This is your kiwi. This is your grape plant. Um, the master gardeners in Rutherford County have an annual grape harvest. It's usually the last weekend or in August or the first weekend in September. Uh, two years ago, we harvested uh, 3,000 pounds, no, 6,000 pounds of grapes off the vineyard at the Ag Center. You come, you get a ride to the grapevines, you um, pick your grapes, you take them back, they juice them for you, then they, you go on, you take your little gallon of juice and you head on home. It's, it, it, it's a win-win for everybody. Um, but uh, it's fun, it, please come. Last weekend in August, first weekend in September, and I digress, I need to move on. Um, <laughs> there's your grapevines. When you, <laughs> <laughs> it's great for grandkids if anybody wants to do that. Uh, if you have grapevines, you have to prune them radically in the winter time. Let's see if I got a. We'll go back. The first growing season, this is what you have. It's not much of anything. You usually have to have wires for support for grapes. You can either have a two wire system or a th uh, one wire system. One wire is at the top. And, uh, or you can have a two wire system where you have one on either side. You have a pole, you have wires over to the side, um, and the grapevine grows up, and you prune it so that you got one branch going this way and one branch going this way, and, but that's not in this season. Second growing season, you see where we started? One branch is going this way, one branch is going that way. Second dormant, this is the growing season. Second dormant season, I only want two to three buds growing every six to eight inches on that grapevine. So you see how the buds have all been cut back, but I'm going to cut them back. I'm not going to cut them that short, but it won't matter because we're not going to get any grapes the second uh, season, third season anyway. Third growing season. This is what we got. You see, there's only so many bran little branches coming off the top and they're supported by that wire. The third dormant season, that my fourth growing season is when I anticipate a crop because I'm leaving those little branches growing off of there. I'm taking everything off the trunk and I'm spreading one branch this way, one branch that way, and every six to eight inches I have two to three little branches coming off. And that's where my grapes are going to come from the next year. Small berries, such as uh, blueberries. Can you see the difference between those two bushes? <laughs> Remove 50 to 60% of plant when planting. This is called renewal pruning. The fruit is produced on wood grown the previous season. And the largest berries are produced on moderately vigorous wood, 12 to 18 inches in length. All weak growth should be removed. You'll be able to tell a weak growth by the diameter of the branch. Uh, anything, if it's less than your little finger, it's probably weak. Um, but that's for your evaluation. You're looking at that plant. I'm not. I have berries growing in a very inopportune spot, so my, my, my little berries never really do well. So they would, it would all be considered weak. I should cut it back to the ground. Um, cut out any twigs that appear to be weak or beginning to die. Make cuts several inches below the affected area. Twigs heavily encrusted with scale insects. Um, anybody familiar with scale insects? Looks like little rough seashells on your branches of your plants. There's a little critter living in there and they excrete calcium. The calcium covers them and they hide in there while you want to kill them. So in order to kill them, you've got to get them when they're particularly susceptible very young and they haven't gotten that calcium 
thing over them. If they're heavily encrusted, remove them. Um, I take great pleasure in burning such things, but that's up, you know, you all do what you want to do. Um, the same techniques for blueberries apply to grapes and currants, but blueberries are one of the plants where you're going to need a, to acidify your soil with some type of fertilizer that has an acid component. They like to acid soil. Cane fruits, that's your blackberries and your raspberries. June bearing raspberries, and this, you can grow these in, your, in, a, in a city yard, in, in a, a regular lot. Remove your split floricanes. Floricanes, uh, raspberries have two sets of canes that come up out of the ground. The first set is your primocane. The next year, those, plant, those canes become your floricanes. They yield the flowers. The flowers yield the fruits. After that, they will never yield anything again. Cut them out. The thinner canes to six to eight inches, and the top canes in row 48 to 60, and keep your cane, let's see, I'm five foot, used to be two, but I don't know anymore. Uh, so your canes could get as tall as this, as tall as me. I know this is too much material, I should have just covered one thing. Um, black and purple raspberries remove dead, dying, and damaged canes. Floricanes will die back after fruiting. You'll be able to tell that it's a dead cane because of the way it looks. It have brown streaks and spots on it. All canes should be topped at 36 inches. 36 inches. Lateral branches should be pruned to 12 to 18 inches. Now we're leaving side branches on my purple and black raspberries. You see that last picture. Ever bearing red or gold raspberries, these are going to bloom. These are going to bloom and fruit twice in a season. Uh, or what the? Yeah, they will. What they'll do is they'll have a big flush in the spring. They'll have sporadic uh, blooming and fruiting in the summer or the, the rest of the summer. Then they'll have a big flush, or a bigger flush, not as big as the spring in the fall. Um, they, you mow them to a height of one to two inches in the dormant season. Although some gardeners prune them like June bearing red raspberries to obtain the spring crop. It's more practical to plant some of the June bears if a spring and a fall crop are desired. Trailing blackberries, these are the ones you see on the side of the road. Uh, though you'll get, you can buy uh, commercial ones. Cultivars. Some are tipped at about six inches above the highest trellis wire and tied to it during the summer months. This is one of them that needs a trellis. A lot of blackberries do need a trellis. For dormant pruning, select five to eight of the strongest canes. Remove all laterals originating on the lower three feet of the canes and tip back remaining laterals to 12 to 18 inches. I know this is too much material. Okay, these are your trellis sim symptoms for your canes. You have a post, usually either with one wire a post with a cross member, that'd be two wires, or a post and two cross wires, one at eye height and one at median height. Uh, it's just different systems, different people use. But this is anticipation of the fact that your fruit's going to be so heavy that it's going to need some support. Hormones in plants, auxins. Cell elongation of roots and stems. Apical dominance, IAA, that's indole acetic acid, is, um, it, it causes growth at the tips and suppresses the growth on the side. Eventually the effect wears off and you get growth at the tips and suppression at the sides. That's for development of stems and flowers and fruits. Um, it prevents the premature fall of leaves, flowers, or fruits, and it's useful in stem cuttings and grafting where it initiates rooting. There's another hormone that's not up here uh, that is in your root stimulating compounds that you can buy in the store. It's called endobutyric acid. 
and it's just called rooting hormone on the outside of the of the of the bottle when you buy it. And when you cut a stem and you want to root it, you you dip that stem in, in the uh, uh, rooting hormone and you put it in a rooting medium to to get new roots. Um, now the indole acetic acid, the first hormone, is useful as promotes flowering in pineapple, and it's also used as a herbicide to kill undes undesirable weeds without affecting monocot pots. We're not going into that. That's the difference between monocots and dicots, and it, I've already thrown too much at you. It helps in cell division and xylem differentiation. Here is a list of my um, references. Now, I'm going to turn the light on real quick because I want to show you the difference between cutting. When you're cutting your woody material out in your yard and it's bigger, this is a really old piece, I'm sorry. This right here, this branch, has, this is the um, bark ring around this. And this material is, is, can differentiate and grow over this hole. If you look at trees that have been properly pruned, they're usually pruned out this much or so, depending upon the tree, from the main trunk or wherever the next biggest member of that woody material is. And this allows this tree to heal, well, to seal itself. Trees and woody organisms don't heal. Like if you cut yourself, you get new tissue. Something, something grows in there and fills in that hole. When a tree gets cut, there's no new tissue. No new, new tissue. What it does is it seals. It grows over and seals that hole because that prevents bacteria and bugs from getting in there and killing this tree. So it seals it if it's properly cut. If you cut the branch out here, when you cut them properly, the tree will seal itself off. It will keep diseases from getting in there. It's a magnificent organism. So cut. Make sure that this right here is the depth that you cut, not this over here. In the spring, the uh, master gardeners will give what's called uh, gardening basics. It's specific to this area. And they also do, a lot of gardeners come to this area and take the master gardener class because they want to learn more about this area as opposed to where they came from. So by all means, contact the Ag Center if you're interested in a weekly. Uh, Garden Basics, I think, is seven or eight weeks. It's just like an hour, two hours a night, uh, once a week. Uh, but the master gardener program is pretty intense. It's um, two months, three months, two, two and a half to three months. And then you have to do 40 hours of volunteer service the first year, and then uh, I think 30, 30 hours of combined education and uh, volunteer work. No, it's 25 every, every year after that. But it's fun, and you hang out with the best people on earth because there's no people on earth like gardeners. Sorry, I mean, if, if you like to get dirty. <laughs> And again, if you have any questions, just ship them to me.